So as I was saying, yesterday we talked about signals mostly as ways to just dump something into the culture media and get these patterns. Uh, and today I'd like to talk about sort of the signaling pathways as dynamic objects that actually interpret those signals and have influences on how these cell fates form. Uh, but before I do that, I didn't quite have time to say everything I wanted to say about these patterns yesterday, so I'm going to spend the first few minutes doing that and then switch gears to talking about signaling dynamics. Um, so just to remind you of what we were talking about yesterday, um, we have these micro-pattern culture systems. Uh, they're made by making complementary patterns of uh, cell and protein phobic things on things that the cells like to stick to, like matrix gel or laminin on the cell surface. When you seed the cells onto them, the cells adhere only in these patches. Um, and then they're confined to these patches so that the confinement uh, it both gives regularity to these systems and increases cell density so that you get these patterns emerge. And these patterns contain uh, all the germ layers along the radial axis of the colony. So you have ectoderm in the center, and the red is mesoderm, and this is extra embryonic tissue. Um, and if you stain for more things, so this uh, green is mesendoderm, and this red is endoderm. So you have all four, all three germ layers and the extra embryonic tissue forming on the radial axis of these colonies. And I talked a little bit yesterday about how this is the response both to the primary signal. So the primary signal primarily signals to the exterior cells in the colony. And they respond and differentiate to these extra embryonic fates. And that creates a secondary nodal signal, which positions these extra fates in between. And then these cells in the center, which don't really see any of those signals, default sort of to this uh, neural or ectodermal fate that happens at the center. Um, so now I'd like to talk a little bit about what happens when you change the shapes of these patterns. So this is a nice uh, thing that you can do with stem cells that you can't really do in other developmental systems, is that I can really play with the geometry and make any shapes I want. And I can target different shapes uh, to ask different questions, right? Like there's been a lot of debate in the developmental literature about diffusion and how far can things diffuse and do diffusible signals from certain cell populations influence things from other cell populations. And so we can pretty cleanly just make these colonies with gaps in them and then ask, do we see any differences in the outside if the center is here or in the center if the outside is here and so on. I'll tell you a little bit about that. And then um, if we're interested in sort of how cells sense shape and corners, we can engineer corners into these things or we can engineer polygons and things like that, and then ask if there are differences in what's in the corner and not. So I'll tell you some results from these things. These things are sort of still quite descriptive. We see differences in all these cases. We don't really understand what we see. So if you have ideas, I definitely welcome them. Uh, so first, thinking a little bit about corners. Um, so are there effects of corners? Uh, the answer is yes. And so we made a series of these regular polygons to ask what happens. So these are sort of representative images of what you get on these different polygons. And these look like cartoons, but they're sort of actually data. So if you um, take averages over many shapes like this, and then threshold the cell fades so that you know where you get this red extra embryonic is shown in red here, and where you primarily have this green is shown in green here, and so on. So you see that you know whereas in a circle, everything is sort of perfectly symmetric around the circle. And so the fates are all equidistant from the boundary. Um, here, you're pretty close to that, but you start to deviate. And then in these other shapes, you start to deviate more. So you see these effects of these corners in inward shifts and widening of the territories, particularly widening of the territory of this mesodermal territory. Um, can be a little bit more quantitative about that. So if I think about taking a region, which is sort of shaded in yellow here, um, and asking what taking sort of an angle from the center, and then asking as a function of that angle from the center, what's the radial, what's the sort of average as a function of angle of these different markers, right? What you see is particularly this uh, brachiary marker. So the corners are denoted with dashed lines here. And this brachiary marker will peak on the corners. But that be becomes less sharp or almost imperceptible here. And then when you get a circle, you'd get a totally flat line. So we see these effects of corners. We think the cells are sort of sensing the corners. That could be due to some kind of diffusible signal. It could be due to some kind of mechanical sensing of corners. We don't really know the answer to that yet. OK, so on to uh, thinking a little bit about diffusion. So what if we make shapes like this and compare them to shapes like this? And so the question here is, I told you yesterday 
that face are formed from the edge inward. So is there any difference from the edge inward in this inner circle and this outer circle? And the answer is really there isn't, right? So if you look at these uh, fate markers here, and you look at these fate markers here, which are these are the inner circle, you don't see any difference. So having this ring around it doesn't influence the inner circle. Interestingly, if you do the converse experiment, right, so you think about what's happening in this outer circle, and then you either don't have an inner circle, you have a small inner circle, you have a large inner circle, you actually do see an effect, right? So we're seeing uh, diffusive signals, which we think are, they essentially reinforce the fate in this outer circle. So you get pure and better expression of the uh, extra embryonic markers in this outer circle um, when you have these central circles. And it's sort of a consistent effect where here you have none, here you have a small circle, and then it's enhanced even more if you have a larger circle. Um, and it's, it's sort of interesting, right, because the patterns we know form from the in, inside outward. So the original signal has to go inside. That's what makes, you know, you get a sequence of fates inwards, but then there seems to be some reciprocal signaling from the outside back to the, from the inside back to the outside, which is important for reinforcing those cell fates on the outside of these patterns. Okay, sorry. So this is the intent. Sorry, this is not well labeled. This is the intensity of the CDX2 marker in the outside tray. So this is the marker of the trophectodermal fate, which is what you would typically get in these outer colonies. And what you see here is that it's, it, this both results from the cells expressing more of it and it being more pure. So you get less of other intervening cell fates in this outer region when you have this circle in the center. So, so somehow there's communication from the center that reinforces the fate. So they, they're not switching fates. These are the fates that they would normally adopt, but they do a better job of adopting it when there are cells in the middle. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, the way these experiments are done, right, you pattern the cells here, and you drop, we drop this BMP morphogen everywhere. Sorry. And the, Right, there's two primary sources of response to the BMP morphogen. One is in the circle itself, and the other is in these, the outer edge of this inner ring, right? Because the inner ring makes the same pattern as the circle we'd usually make. But then when we see that happening, right, we see that also reinforces what's happening in this outer circle. It's outside the cells as well. Uh, Actually, so a lot later, I'll show you some, but the cells will take it up and the ligand will be depleted over time, but that really only happens at low concentrations of the BMP. So if you have a low concentration and you watch the signaling response, you'll see it decay, and you can tell that's due to ligand depletion because if you take that same ligand and move it to another well of naive cells, right, you'll see that decay just continue from where it left off, so it's really like the ligand is being removed extracellularly. But at the concentrations we use to get these fates, that's, it's not really a factor, right? So the, the, there's plenty of ligand around. They don't really eat up the ligand outside the cells, right? So we think most of these effects are actually secondary signals. Actually, I, this is pretty speculative, but our best guess for what's happening is that um, actually you reinforce these fates by inhibiting the secondary signal. So what happens in these central colonies, we think, is that you here you make nodal, but you also make lefty inhibitors. And it's thought that the lefty inhibitors diffuse further than the nodal. So we think these inhibitors of secondary fates get to these outer colonies, and then they prevent them from adopting these secondary fates. And a little bit of evidence for that, which I'm not showing you, is if I take these circles and I make them asymmetric, so I move them closer to these things, I actually see the opposite effect. Right? So I see that I get some inhibition of this fate and a little bit of upregulation of the secondary fate. So we think that the, uh, the, the sort of central things are sources for either the secondary morphogens or inhibitors of the secondary morphogens. And at certain distances, you're more likely to get inhibitors of those secondary morphogens, and that reinforces the primary fate. Does that make, I don't know if that makes sense. More questions. OK, so then we wanted to ask a question. Um, so it seems like the boundaries in these colonies are very important. Right? You always get the same pattern from outside to inside. And the sort of naive expectation of if you didn't have a boundary was that you would get everything adopting the inside fate. 
and isn't that true? And so uh, postdoc in my lab, it's a, it's a Hume-Skirk had a good idea, which is what if we can get beads, we can grow cells on the surface of the beads, and so that if you, ha you have the same surface area as these normal colonies, but it actually has no boundary, right? It's just making a complete surface around the sphere, and then we differentiate the same, them in the same way and ask what you get. And so here are some of these pictures of these things, and what you'll find is that these things will almost always autonomously polarize such that you get different fates on the different sides of the sphere. Um, all right, so uh, roughly these, these are labeled in DAPI, but if we were to label them, they would label them, they would label for these extra embryonic fates, and then you get these mesodermal fates on the other side. And so we think that the patterning system that makes these fates is sort of capable of totally self-organizing these patterns without an asymmetry from the, from the boundary, but that if you do have a boundary, that it will bias that asymmetry such that you position particular fates in particular places. Yeah. Yeah, so you take a, uh, like a polystyrene bead, I think it is, and then you coat that bead with laminin, and then you soak that bead in a cell suspension so that the cells stick all around the bead. And so I'm actually, I'm not showing you the initial distribution, but initially the cells are uniform around, so you'd see a flat, this sort of even cross section around. Um, and then as the cells differentiate, they actually do what they do in these 2D cultures, which is where they express brachiary, they kind of pile up. Where they have these extra embryonic fates, they're flatter and more spread out. And so they've sort of recapitulated at least some of this cell fate pattern on the surface of these beads when they differentiate. Does that make sense? Uh, uh, yeah, so I think these beads might have to be a little bit bigger to, to get that, um, but I, I think we will, yeah. Is, is it yes, what we think, yes. Um, and so, an interest, oh, and interest, well, okay, I'll show you something. This is kind of a bigger bead. So we've actually sort of fortuitously come across cases where you get two beads glommed together, so, and then what we always find pretty much is that you recapitulate the whole pattern, but one sulfate forms on one bead, one sulfate forms on another bead, and the mesoderm forms in the middle, right? So here, this is actually the epidermal fate on this bead here. This is the mesoderm in the middle, and this is the extra embryonic fate on this side. And so this kind of, right, so here, there's no sort of uh, intrinsic bias, there's no real boundary, but there's, there's kind of ge geometry constraining this thing, and, they, and then these things somehow pick one sphere to be one fate, one sphere to be another fate, and another thing in the middle. Yeah. Sorry, what? Oh, it's polystyrene. So it's, it's, it's like a plastic bead, basically. Um, so it's, the, it's basically the same stuff we would grow cells on in the culture surface, but in a bead of, I think it's 200 micron diameter, something like that. Um, and so the cells are, if you code it right, the cells can just grow on the surface of it, right? So, the, I mean, you can think of, this is a cross-section through the bead. So these are not, it's not a solid ball of cells, right? It's a sheet of cells growing on a curved surface of a bead, right? So, and the, so the idea was to, as closely as we can, mimic these 2D culture systems, but not actually have a boundary. So we could see if the cells could pattern themselves without having the boundary. Okay, the last thing I want to talk about about this is we also got interested in, is this a general strategy? So we've done this for early embryonic patterning. We've made different germ layers, but can we take the same strategy and pattern later fates in development, right? So is this only applicable to the sort of earliest stages of development starting from stem cells, or would it be possible to start with a different progenitor population which has a different spectrum of fates and differentiate them and get similar patterns? And so uh, to start out, we were interested in whether we can get patterns of pure ectoderm within the germ layer. And so the idea, so I, I told you yesterday um, that if I take stem cells, the default fate of those stem cells is a neural fate, right? So if I just take stem cells, I abrogate all signaling, those cells are all going to become neurons. And then within the ectodermal germ layer, actually it's the same BMP signal that we're using to differentiate to different germ layers, which will push cells to different fates within that germ layer. So if I take cells which are committed to ectoderm and I treat them with BMP based on results in other model systems, I should get epidermis and I should get neural crest in between the epidermis and the actual neural tissue. And so the question was, can we push cells towards neural differentiation? Hopefully they get restricted from becoming these other germ layers 
and then hit them with the BMP and then see these sulfate patterns emerge, but now we should get different sulfate patterns. They, they should be patterns within the ectoderm instead of patterns between all the germ layers. Um, so our first attempts at this were almost successful, but not quite successful. Um, so if you do this protocol, the cells actually retain the ability to be diverted to mesoderm for quite a long time, which surprised us, right? So if you do three days of neural differentiation and then hit them with BMP, um, you get still a little bit of mesoderm and this SOX2 marker at this stage is sort of pan ectodermal. So we get almost pure ectoderm. I'm not showing you the subdivisions within the ectoderm, but we get a little bit of mesoderm. And it's interesting that actually the extra embryonic fate that you usually get at the borders of these colonies is totally restricted. So you, you'll first lose the ability to form that extra embryonic fate, but retain the ability to form mesoderm, which is somehow a secondary response in these colonies, but most of your colony will be ectoderm. And we said, okay, this mesoderm must come from some residual nodal signaling. So we'll do nodal and BMP inhibitors for three days. Then we'll treat with BMP, but we'll keep inhibiting nodal so you can't get mesoderm. And that worked to give us pure ectoderm. And that actually also works to give us patterns of sulfate within the epidermis. So now these look quite similar to the patterns I showed you earlier, but the sulfate identities are totally different, right? So the, this middle expresses PAC6, which is a marker for neurons. This ring of red, which is where I would have seen the mesoderm in my other colonies, expresses SOX9, which is a marker for neural crest. And then this outside expresses AP2-alpha, which in the absence of this SOX9 neural crest marker uh, is typically a marker for epidermis. It's a marker for non-neural ectoderm. And you can make radial average of these things and see what you expect, which is that you get this sort of series of fates along the radial axis in almost all of these colonies. The BMP, whatever structure is in the, there, we, we haven't actually checked in this system yet. In the pluripotent stem cell system, there's no gradient in the supplied BMP, but there's a gradient in the response to the BMP, right? And this, we believe, results from a couple of factors that I talked about yesterday, right? One is uh, we know it's dependent on secreted inhibitors to the BMP pathway, which we think accumulate in the center of these colonies. And the second is there's this process where the, the cells acquire apical basal polarity, which is particularly pronounced in the centers of these colonies, and the receptors get sequestered basally. And so that the cells don't, even though the BMP is everywhere, the cells are not BMP responsive in the center because the receptors are sequestered on the bottom of the cells and they're not accessible to the BMP. So this, the cell, and this is here, I don't know for sure, right? It's possible that similar mechanisms work. It's possible not. What, what I'm nearly positive of is that the center cells don't respond very well to the BMP because if they did, they wouldn't have committed to the neural. They wouldn't adopt the neural fate. I guess it, technically there is a second possibility here, which is that we're pushing them towards neural differentiation for three days before we do this. And so it's possible that there's a sort of gradient of commitment, right? So maybe the cells in the middle see the BMP, but they've already committed to the neural fate and they can't adopt a different fate. That's possible. Um, and we, we, have to, we have to do the assays for looking at the, the BMP signaling to see whether they actually respond or not. Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, it, it is, BMP is the initial signal which kicks off all these processes. I actually think both of these, both of these systems are very similar, as I'll show you in a second, in the sense that I have the primary BMP signal, I have a differential response to that BMP signal, and then I induce a secondary signal, and so the, the, the sort of intermediate fate in both of these colonies is dependent on a secondary signal, not on BMP. This plot, you're saying? Yeah, so this is if I, uh, well, we should have made better axes. But yes, this is, this is the center of the colony. This is the edge of the colony. And then for each data point here, I've basically taken a bin at that radius, taken the intensity of every cell, and averaged all the cells in that bin. So it's, it's an average of all the cells that distance away from the center of the colony. Okay, so we can look for secondary signals that influence these patterns. And of course, since people know quite a bit about ectodermal differentiation, we had some idea about what these secondary signals are. Um, so if we inhibit the wind pathway, which is thought to be important for this neural crest specification, you don't get any neural crest anymore. And this looks sort of like what happens when you inhibit nodal in our other patterns. 
Right? So you get some of these outer fates, you get some of these inner fates, you get absolutely none of this red. So we think that there's this, in the same way that you have this initial response to BMP and then upregulation of nodal in the pluripotent colonies, in these colonies you have the its initial response to BMP, then upregulation of Wnt in particular areas that creates these central territories. Um, and then interestingly, if you inhibit notch, um, you get all the fates, but you actually don't make proper borders between the fates, particularly at these outside colonies. So these um, neural crest and epidermal fates, they get all mixed up on the outside of the colony. And well, this is sort of loosely consistent with the role for notch and border specifying, although we don't totally know how it works yet. Okay, uh, before I move on, I just wanted to sort of mention for completeness that um, other people are sort of modeling development in vitro in a lot of different systems, and there's sort of a lot of remarkable, really remarkable sort of organoid systems that recapitulate the morphology of developmental systems in 3D. So this is sort of one of my favorite examples where people have grown essentially entire eye cups starting from pluripotent stem cells, right? So this is an in vitro grown uh, sort of cup of the eye. Uh, and I'm not going to get into the details of what these different things are, but you have the proper markers for different fates. You have the right basement membranes made between cell fates. And they have this sort of remarkable organization, and this is totally self-organized. Um, another system where this has become pretty advanced um, is growing uh, sort of uh, crypt-like structures that you would see in, in the gut. And these are structures where you have stem cells at the bottom, and then the cells proliferate up. And so each one of these things is an individual crypt, and they grew this giant sort of gut-like structure, and the red marks proliferating cells. So you can see that the stem cells are typically only located in these crypts, and then this other region is non-proliferative. And I think a sort of challenge for the field going forward is that you know, people can really do amazing things with these organoid cultures, but they're much, much less reproducible than the kinds of things we're doing, where you throw your stuff in culture. Sometimes you get something really beautiful like this. Sometimes you get things that look like three eye cups fused together. Um, and so we, I think, with sort of a bio bioengineering challenge, and both for us, for pluripotent systems, to think about them going into 3D, and for these organoid models to try to take these systems and, and move them into places where we can really do these kinds of beautiful patterns, but make them reproducible and quantifiable in 3D so we can understand what's happening. Okay, any questions on that before I move on? Okay, uh, so this is what I actually wanted to talk about today. So I'm, today, I'm gonna talk more about the signaling dynamics and the dynamics of these pathways that give rise to these structures. Um, so I'd like to start out by giving you a theoretical example of why you should care about signaling dynamics. Uh, and then I'm going to give you a sort of experimental example, which uh, is the NF-kappa-B pathway, which is probably well, one of the only pathways where the signaling dynamics have been sort of well studied for quite some time. Um, and then I'd like to tell you about some of our own work relating signaling dynamics to sulfate in a highly simplified system, and then some of our work looking uh, in more complex cultures at the signaling dynamics of morphogen pathways, if I have time. Okay, um, so to motivate this theoretical example, I wanted to show this movie again of gastrulation um, and to point out a couple of features of this. So you see this dark spot here where the gastrulation is going to begin. Um, this is the dorsal lip of the blastopore, and this is also a signaling center. So secreted signals from this dorsal lip are very important for generating the fates in the cells as they move by this dorsal lip. Um, and the other thing I want you to notice as you watch this movie is that you'll form this ring all around where cells are invaginating, but cells invaginate first and much more aggressively at the dorsal lip than at the ventral side of this blastopore. Right, so you see the cells invaginating here. They're invaginating here too, but not nearly as strongly. Um, and then eventually gastrulation is over and you go through this neuralation process, right? So you have this uh, system, which I think is somewhat common to other gastrulating systems, where you have a source of morphogen, you have cells moving by the source of morphogen, but depending on their spatial position, the cells move by the source of morphogen more or less quickly, right? And so I think it's important to think about the dynamics of these cases, um, because, right, cells are seeing the source, they're seeing the source depending on how they move, and how they interpret that signal as they go by will influence the cell fate pattern. Um, so I wanted to sort of think a little bit about uh, sort of theoretical example uh, based on this kind of idea. And the idea is that if I have 
a sheet of cells and it's going to move through a morphogen gradient. Right? So the morphogen gradient is high where it's purple and low where it's yellow. So these cells are all going to move here. And let's imagine that there's some kind of velocity profile to these cells moving through these morphogen gradients. Right? So the ones with the big arrow are moving quickly and the ones with the small arrow are moving slowly. So this is not uh, obviously a perfect model for anything real developmental, but it's sort of a rough approximation to what's happening in gas relation in a number of systems where you have a source, you're moving past that source of morphogen, and you're moving past the source of morphogen at different speeds depending on where you are. And then what you want to think about is, okay, you have cells and they're moving through this field of signal, and then you want to ask, does it, if I move through this field of signal at different speeds, how is that going to influence how I see the signal? And it turns out that the answer depends rather dramatically on how I interpret the signal as I see it. Um, and so I can imagine a couple of different scenarios for how I interpret the signal. So a number of pathways, and I'll get to a pathway that does this later, uh, have been shown to essentially be adaptive, which means that they respond to changes in the signal. But if the signal were to remain constant, they don't respond. They don't interpret constant signals. So basically, they respond to increases in ligand. The sort of simplest idea is that you would respond to the level of ligand that you see. So as you're going along, you see changing levels of ligand, and that's what you care about. You care about the current level of ligand, not some derivative. And then another simple possibility is that you might care about the total amount of ligand that you see over time. So as I'm moving through this gradient, I see ligand. I continue to see ligand as I move through. I just integrate that over time. And however my, much my integral is, that's how much I care. And so if you just go ahead and OK, so it depends. Yeah, so, but I, I, okay, I actually think that the time to move past is, so uh, our own work has shown that, uh, for example, the nodal signaling pathway is adaptive in response to these ligands, so it, it actually does this kind of thing in red here, um, and that um, the time scale for that adaptation in mammalian systems is on the order of four hours. Um, and that the time that it takes cells, well, I'm not, I'm not sure exactly how long it takes an individual cell to move through the primitive streak. I wish Kat was still here. But I think it's also on the order of probably slightly longer than that, right? The whole gastrulation process takes like a day and a half. So the time scale after time, we can't I think we can't, I think we can't ignore this. And when, so uh, I'll show you also a little later. We've looked a little bit in Xenopus embryos during my postdoc. And the, um, the time scales of the adaptation are much faster. And that corresponds with the speed of the gastro, right? And Xenopus gastrulation takes a few hours, but the adaptation also takes like less than an hour. Um, and so, you know, I, I think we actually do have to care about this in this example. I, I think there are, uh, there are almost certainly, yeah, I, I think there's basically lots of cases where the signaling dynamics matter for, for what you see. OK, so back to this. I have these different scenarios. And then I remember I have cells that are moving quickly and cells that are moving slowly. Right? So um, it's sort of intuitive. But you, well, so first of all, right, the, the sort of total profile of ligand that I see, the, if I just see the ligand, right, it's the same. It's just compressed in the fast moving cells. Right? That's these blue curves. If, uh, if I care about increases in the ligand, right, I'm going to see a faster increase in the ligand if I'm moving faster, because I'm moving through this morphogen field. And so the red curve is higher here than here. But if I care about integrated ligand, right, then as I move through this field, if I move slower, I'm just going to see more integrated ligand because I spend more time moving through this morphogen field. And so this green curve is lower here than here. And so uh, actually, if I think about this, right, so well, then I have to take these curves and come up with some rule for the sulfate. Um, and I've done that in the simplest possible way, which is just to take the maximum of these curves over time. And so if I think about that, right, if I, um, if I only care about the ligand, well, every cell is passing through the same morphogen rate at some, uh, same morphogen field at some rate, right? So if I'm just taking the maximum of that, I actually don't care how fast I move through it, and I don't make any spatial pattern whatsoever. 
Um, on the other hand, if I'm integrating the ligand, right, the slowest cells are going to be seeing the most ligand. So I'll get some profile of integrated ligand that looks like this. And maybe I'll make some, you know, French flag sulfate pattern that looks like this. Uh, in the sort of reverse scenario where I don't care about the integration of the ligand, but I care about how fast the ligand is changing, right, the cells that see the most ligand are the cells that are moving fastest because it changes the fastest. These cells see the least ligand. And so if I think about my sulfate pattern, it will be exactly reversed, right? So, um, so I mean, I, I think this system is sort of a toy model. It's probably not very realistic, but it has a few surprising features, um, which are, first of all, that you, all these gradients are made from the gradients of the cell motion, and so they're all sort of orthogonal to the morphogen gradient. And secondly, you get opposite trends in which uh, way the pattern forms, depending on whether you're integrating your signal or depending on whether you're using this adaptive response and essentially differentiating your signal. And so hopefully this sort of convinces you that we really should care about what the dynamics of ligand are and how we think about these things. Okay, uh, so now I want to tell you a little bit about how we measure signaling dynamics through uh, an example which has been well studied in a number of labs, which is the signaling pathway NF-kappa B. This is not really thought to be a particularly important pathway, at least in mammalian systems for developmental processes, but it is important for a lot of things like signaling during immunity and inflammation and things like that. Um, and I don't want to get too into sort of the wiring diagram of the pathway, but essentially what happens is that you have some input, uh, it activates this IKK, and then the important signal transducer is this NF-kappa B, which is usually sequestered by this I-kappa B molecule. The I activated IKK destroys this I-kappa B and frees this NF-kappa B to move to the nucleus, right? So, uh, you know, if you don't want to worry too much about the details, basically the input leads to the destruction of this inhibitor, NF-kappa B moves to the nucleus, then importantly, these inhibitors are also transcriptional targets of the pathway, right? So you, uh, you allow this to move in, but then you make these inhibitors, which will relocalize it back to the cytoplasm, and eventually the NF-kappa B goes back to the cytoplasm. Um, and I think it's important to note that we can, you know, wiring diagrams like this, we know enough information to basically make wiring diagrams at this level or much more complex wiring diagrams for basically any signaling pathway you care to think about. GGF beta, BMP, notch, uh, FGF, well, whatever you want, right? We know the receptors, we know the cascade, we know the target genes, but you can look at this and still not know anything about the dynamics. I can look at this and then I'll ask you, okay, now I'm gonna stimulate this pathway. What should the dynamics look like? You, you really couldn't tell me. It really depends a lot on the parameters of how you parameterize this pathway and also might vary from situation to situation. Um, and so uh, it's sort of instructive to think about how people have measured this and there's been a real split in the field of people measuring this dynamics and how they like to do it. And so there's sort of the classical biochemists who will do things like this. So sorry, this is not well labeled. These are different times basically. So this is moving forward in time. Um, so they'll take cells, they'll fractionate the nuclei, they'll ask how much NF-kappa B protein is in the nucleus, and they typically see a profile like this, which is that it, uh, you know, gets activated by the ligand, it decays a little bit, this is not a real quantitative assay, so it's hard to tell how much it decays, then it comes back on, and then maybe it's going down kind of slowly. Um, then uh, people using approaches that I think people here are more sympathetic to have done things like this, which are to tag the protein with RFP or GFP and watch it move in and out of the nucleus. And if you're watching, I'll play that one more time. If you're watching this movie kind of carefully, you'll see these kind of dramatic oscillations where you see these nuclei fill in and then empty, and then there that fills in and empties and fills in and empties. So you see these kind of dramatic oscillations at the single cell level of this NF-kappa B pathway. Uh, so just to sort of briefly contrast these two techniques, right, the nice thing about this technique is that I don't need to modify cells here. Obviously, I have to make my fluorescent cells. Here, I have to worry about overexpression artifacts, and this has been the source of a lot of controversy in this field of whether these oscillations are real or not, or they're just overexpression artifacts. But of course, here, I get dynamic single cell information, which is what I think a lot of the people in this room are after, and here, I just get bulk information, and only these dynamics from collecting multiple samples and no single cell information. Um, of course, there are techniques that are sort of somewhere in the middle, right? So if I were to do immunofluorescence on these cells, 
I could get single cell information, but not necessarily dynamic information unless I collect multiple samples again. Um, so people have really been sort of fighting back and forth about which of these are better in the NF kappa B field. And the question is, do they really give the same answer, right? So if you look at this sort of profile, right, this is sort of what you see in this, uh, in these biochemical assays. And if I look at this, this is what you see in the single cell assays. And then, you know, one might argue that actually the mean of this is not too different from the mean of this, right? What's happening is here, right? You have an initial synchronized oscillation, and then you have asynchronous oscillations. And the average of those asynchronous oscillations tends to result in something decaying as they become more and more asynchronous. And here you're just looking at the single cells asynchronizing. Um, but I think it's still quite controversial whether anyone really believes these single cells actually oscillate or whether actually what you really have is a population of cells that do this. Um, and so uh, whichever view you take of that, one of the most imp interesting things that people have studied about these pathways is to look at the target genes of these pathways and to ask, okay, I have this NF-kappa B translocating to the nucleus. This NF-kappa B is a transcription factor. And what are the uh, consequences of the NF-kappa B dynamics for uh, turning on target genes. And so here you see these NF-kappa B dynamics that I was talking about. Um, and here you see two NF-kappa B targets. It's not really important what they are. But you see that one turns on rather quickly, and one takes a long time to go on. And so if I give it just a brief pulse of the NF-kappa B, this one that takes a long time to go on basically doesn't, whereas I still get this one that turns on quickly. So you have targets that turn on selectively with sustained activation, and targets that turn on uh, selectively when I give it a pulse. And so the pathway, the target genes in the same cell can sort of tell the difference between different dynamics of NF-kappa B that I've stimulated with. They have ways of removing the negative feedback, and then actually you still get these sustained targets turning on even with a 15-minute pulse. Um, but the interpretation of this is quite different. So the people who say this oscillates actually have a story about how you require sustained oscillations to turn on particular target genes. Whereas, you know, people who do biochemistry are saying, OK, well, you still have some sustained baseline level signaling. Um, and then just the last slide on this. So my own lab got interested in this because in addition to development, we do some work on cancer. And this is an important pathway in cancer. Uh, and so these are some ovarian cancer cells. Um, and something that really hasn't been done because it's sort of uh, relatively recent technology is all the uh, studies with single cell dynamics have all been done with these overexpression studies. And we're now capable of just taking CRISPR, fusing CRISPR to the endogenous thing. And then, yeah, you still have to worry about whether the fusion impacts function, but you don't have to worry about the effects of overexpression. So these are cells where we've used CRISPR to fuse YFP uh, to the endogenous locus of these things in ovarian cancer cells, which is a model that we're interested in for other reasons. Then we can make these movies. Um, eventually, they'll be stimulated. You'll see it is pretty obvious. There, and it goes to the nucleus, and then you'll see it kind of decays over time, and you don't see any of these dramatic single cell oscillations, right? And so, if you um, quantify this at different doses, right, you see more or less what you see in these biochemical assays, which is you see this initial response, this kind of wiggle, and then this slow decay. Um, this wiggle is sort of less pronounced than I would have expected from the biochemistry, um, but what I think this shows is that you can get sort of more accurate results, more in line with what you would expect from the, um, fr from the sort of experiments done on unmodified cells if you're making better reporters and using CRISPR to do it. Um, this actually hasn't been done in the same cell lines that were done in those papers, so we really need to go back and do that and see if it's a difference of cell lines or a difference otherwise in dynamics. So. This is heterozygous. So there's one. There's one copy that has YFP fused to it, and one copy that's not. We, we've, we actually we made a few lines. One of them turned out to be homozygous. The dynamic so, and we I'm not showing you, but we, we've done quite a bit of controls, just doing immunofluorescence at different time points, and then asking if we get the same. You know, we can basically ask at static time points, do we get the same result from immunofluorescence? And the results look much better in the heterozygote than the homozygote. I don't know why. Um, so we're using the heterozygote. Yeah, maybe it affects feedbacks. And, and so here, if the heterozygote, if the fusion transcribes a little less efficiently, you're rescued by the other allele or something like that. Yeah, that's possible. Do you have some data on the 
Yeah, so we, we need to do that. So we are working, the easy thing to do is to do qPCR for a bunch of these target genes, which is what people have done. What would be really nice to do is to engineer reporters and single cells to look at these target genes, which to my knowledge nobody has done yet, but I, I think that's worth doing. And, and actually not terribly difficult now with CRISPR, but we, we don't have the data. Okay, uh, so that's nice, right? That shows you something about signaling dynamics, but what we're, we're really interested in, in the long term, is relating signaling dynamics to cell fate. Um, I first wanted to show you uh, a movie to just give you some idea of how challenging this is. So uh, my lab has been working a little bit with a neighboring lab at Rice, with Dan Wagner's lab, and we're interested in generating signaling reporters to some of the same pathways we're interested in the zebrafish, because it's a really beautiful system for imaging and it allows us to study some of the same signaling pathways. So this is a TGF beta signaling pathway reporter in fish, which you're watching during the process of epiboly and gastrulation. And these dots are nuclei where the signaling pathway is active. And so you can watch this sort of process of gastrulation and the activity of the signaling pathway. Um, and well, what you can see from this is that you, and, you, know, you can see things, you can measure things, but this thing is, is sort of a tremendous mess, right? We've had actually a great deal of difficulty um, following individual cells, extracting uh, temporal information from individual cells, and then trying to correlate that with the final position of the cells where the fate ends up. And so we're still working on this, um, but we really wanted to get to situations where we can actually really dissect you know, what the signaling is and what the fate is and correlate those things. And even in colonies of stem cells, we're working on that too, that has proved to be somewhat difficult. So we tried to come up with as simple a system as possible where we could address these kind of issues. And so uh, we're thinking a lot of the complication comes from the fact that if I imagine a sheet of cells and I think about some cell sitting in the middle of this sheet of cells, there's all kinds of influences, right? If I'm thinking about a stem cell culture, as we've talked about, I'm going to dump some media and growth factors in here that's going to influence what the cells do. And so the cells are maybe going to see that growth factor. Um, but they're also going to see what all their neighbors see. And disentangling these two effects is quite difficult. And if I really want to understand the input-output relationships of signaling pathways and how they relate to cell fates, I really have to disentangle, you know, how is the cell responding to what I'm supplying and what I'm telling it to do? And how is the cell responding to paracrine signals? And so the idea that we had is, well, we can use the same micropatterning technology we use to grow cells in these colonies of well-defined size and shape to grow very small colonies of cells. So then I could have a colony with only one cell. Now it has no paracrine interactions with its neighbors. And then I can look, compare that to a colony with two cells where I do have some paracrine interaction and compare that to three cells where I have presumably more paracrine interactions and so on. And do I see trends in how cells signal and differentiate depending on how many neighbors they have. Um, so we've made these arrays. So we don't, we don't actually make only one cell colonies or two cell colonies. What we do is we make these arrays of tiny colonies that can't touch because they're separated. And then you, right, you have a one cell colony here and here, or two cell colonies, or colonies with more cells. And then we can computationally separate the number of cells in the colony and do analysis and, and ask, you know, does it make a difference? Is this two cell colony different from this six cell colony? And so on. Uh, so this is just a distribution of colony sizes in a typical experiment. So we have reasonably well represented from, say, one to about eight cells. And past that, the data gets sketchy. Um, so we're going to take these tiny colonies and treat them with the same BMP4 signal that gave us these patterns in these larger colonies and see what we get. Um, and here we get something kind of interesting. And what we see is that, um, perhaps not surprisingly, we get conversion to a single cell fate. And that single cell fate is what you would get at the edge of these bigger colonies. So all these cells somehow know they're near the edge of a colony. They all respond to the signal. And they adopt a single cell fate. They do this in a dose-dependent manner. Um, so you see here, right, I have all basically here. It's not terribly important what the markers are, but green mark stem cells. And red mark these extra embryonic fates. So when I have no ligand, I'm all green. If I add a little bit of ligand, I start to see some red cells. If I add a little bit more ligand, I see more red cells. And if I had enough ligand, I'd basically converted all the cells. So I get this kind of switch-like behavior just between these two cell fates. That's correct. Yeah, so we, we've looked for, for correlations between like neighbors, and we don't see them. Um, so we, we think that they're, 
uh, far enough apart and the cell numbers are small enough that they, they just don't secrete anything enough to make it to the neighboring colonies. Um, yeah, they, they, can't, they can't bridge this gap and touch it all because they're divided by these areas of material that they won't stick to. Yeah. Inside the colony, yeah. So you're only looking at the nuclei here. Right, so every, everything I'm showing you is in the nuclei, but they're, yeah, they're touching each other. Sorry, I didn't. I'm going to tell you that in a minute. Okay, uh, so this is just to convince you that basically we only have two faces in this colony. Um, right, so you know, here's the percentage of cells that show the pluripotent fate in blue, the percentage that show this extra embryonic in, in red, and the percentage of cells that are one fate or the other in purple. And so it accounts for, in all cases, it accounts for 90 plus percent of the colony. So you really have this switch-like thing where you're turning off one fate and turning on the other fate. And it's interesting, this is in contrast, right, to the experiments where the same ligand, the same treatment will make these patterns of multiple cell fates in larger colonies. And it's also interesting how sensitive the cells become to this ligand in small colonies. So to get these patterns, I actually need to add 50 micrograms per ml, which is way out here. Right? To get a pure population of cells, I can do it with almost 100-fold less, uh, yeah, about 100-fold less ligand here. So the cells in these tiny colonies are very, very sensitive, and they differentiate quite homogeneously to one fate. Uh, so the first thing we noticed when we did this is that if you look at these sort of heterogeneous conditions, right, you get some fraction of red and some fraction of green cells, but they're not randomly distributed at all, right? In this picture, I have, you know, four or five red cells, but they're all within the same colony, right? And here I have some red colonies and some green colonies. So cells are making a decision at the level of the colony as a whole and not at the level of a single cell. Um, so if you scatter plot single cell data, right, so here's the intensity of the pluripotent marker, here's the intensity of the uh, stem cell marker, right, what you see, and it's color-coded by the number of cells in the colony, right? So you can see this most clearly here, right? The larger colonies all cluster together at higher expression of the stem cell marker and lower expression of the, of the differentiation marker. In larger colonies, in, sorry, higher differentiation conditions, you see the reverse, right? The larger colonies are all differentiating well, the colonies that fail to express this marker are, um, are, are all single cell colonies, right? So you, you get this sort of a reinforcement of the fate. The, the, whatever fate is more common is better reinforced in larger colonies than smaller colonies. Um, so if you look a little bit more quantitatively at distributions of single cells, and now this is in pluripotent conditions, right? So this is the pluripotency marker. So what I see is that if I have, say, seven cell colonies, Essentially, every cell expresses this pluripotency marker, but if I have one cell colonies, I have a, basically a two-peak distribution where I have one peak that corresponds with expression, which is where these seven cell colonies are, and then I have one peak which corresponds to basically cells that have differentiated. Right, so this is showing us that some fraction of cells in these one cell colonies have differentiated, and this never happens in these seven cell colonies under pluripotent conditions. And if I look at the differentiation marker, I see the same thing in reverse, right? So these seven cell colonies all keep this differentiation marker off, but they have this long shoulder in the one cell colonies of things that have started to turn this differentiation marker on. If I look at differentiated conditions, I see the same thing exactly in reverse, right? So differentiated cells um, will, in larger colonies, will turn off these markers, but in smaller colonies, will keep, well, some fraction of them will keep the marker on. And for the differentiation marker, they'll, in larger colonies, they'll all turn it on, and in smaller colonies, some of them will fail to, right? So you have this two-state system. The larger colonies are actually very good at interpreting which state they're supposed to be in. So in pluripotent conditions, they're uniformly pluripotent. In differentiation conditions, they uniformly differentiate. The one-cell colonies sometimes get confused, basically, and they'll sometimes differentiate in pluripotent conditions or fail to differentiate in differentiation conditions. Uh, yeah? So we consider it as having seven cells, and the reason is because when we've looked uh, 
this live cell imaging of the array. So you have a little colony, it has seven cells in, and cell rearrangement within the colony over the scale of the two days that this differentiation takes are quite frequent. Right, so I don't, it's not, you know, if I pick any two cells in the colony, it's not correct to say that they're always neighbors or always not neighbors. The colony is always shuffling around. So I think that there's enough cell mixing in this colony that we consider it to be one colony, one sort of colony where every cell is kind of the neighbor of every other cell. So, so, I, okay, I'm, I'm not sure I understood. What, I mean, each, data point that goes into this histogram is a single cell, um, but it just, they're just color coded depending on whether they came from colonies that, that are the only cell or whether they came from colonies where they're seven. No, so there's no cherry picking. For the colony of set, the colony of seven cells will contribute seven data points to this histogram, right? So every every cell is accounted for and histogrammed. It's just that the seven cell colony will contribute seven data points, the expression of every single cell in that colony, and the one cell colony is contribute only one data point because there's only one cell. sure we have really good data. I guess what I would say is that I think if it were an effect of just ligand trapping, if I were to increase the concentration of the ligand itself, I should see the effect go away, right? Because then in the one cell colonies, I should just have enough ligand floating around and that doesn't happen, right? So whether, whether, um, uh, where they go? So whether I'm working right over here where I've just gotten to sort of 100% or whether I'm working at, you know, an order of magnitude plus greater than that, I see the same effect. Um, so I, yeah, I, I agree. It, it, technically, I think it seems possible that if ligand is sticky to cells, cells sort of trap ligand and then present it to their neighbors. Um, but uh, but I, I guess the only data we have that really argues against that is that it's, it's not, the effect we see doesn't depend on the concentration in this range. Uh, it is, yeah, I, okay, I don't think that is thought, it is internalized into the cells that take it up, but I don't think it's been described to be passed to neighboring cells, although, I mean, I, I think that would be a biochemical mechanism, but it's, it's non trip right? I mean, if you have more cells that are able to make a collective decision because they're sort of passing a common pool of ligand between them, I, I think that's interesting, but... But yeah, I, I don't I don't have any evidence that that is or isn't the case here. Mm -hmm. Uh, okay, so, uh, so 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 historically, this was reminiscent to us of some old work uh, from John Gurdon, who won the Nobel Prize, as I talked about yesterday, not for this, but for uh, reprogramming of frog nuclei to pluripotency. Um, but what he described in a sort of very qualitative way was that if you take these animal cap cells, which again are sort of like the pluripotent cells of the frog, you dissociate them and you put them between the vegetal tissue, which is the tissue on the bottom of the frog, which should induce them to become mesodermal fates, and then you look at how well they're introduced, 
He noticed that if you put them in sparsely, they wouldn't induce very well, but if you put them in in solid clumps, they would induce much better. And he called this a community effect in development, right? So cells that are sort of isolated don't read this whatever signals are emanating from these vegetal cells well, but cells that are in a solid clump do. Um, and so, you know, we, we think that the stem cell systems are sort of a system where you actually see this effect also, and you can study it quantitatively. Um, so here's just a sort of picture, which we sort of cherry pick to visualize this event, right? So all nuclei are marked in green. The differentiation marker is marked in red. And you can really see, right, this individual cell doesn't differentiate. But right next to it, you have these colonies of more cells that are differentiating very well. Yes? Yeah, that's something we're working on, right? So it, it is possible that, right, so they've been growing on these dishes for for two days at this point. So it is possible they're related to each other. So we're, we're actually trying to do simple things where we, you know, independently sort of barcode or just like put an independent fluorescent protein on the cells so we can tell if they came from the same thing or not. There's actually, when we watch the movies, there's there's significant cell division, but there's also significant cell death. So my, right, so my guess would be these one cell colonies, it's, it's actually very unlikely that it would just sit there as one cell the whole time. It probably divided once and then died. Um, what we think from the live cell data that the parameter that probably matters is the number of cells that are in the colony at the time you stimulate it with the ligand. Um, that's sort of when, or at least close to that time, that's when they're reading it out. But we, we don't have good proof for that either. Uh, yeah, so this, so this cell fails to so differentiate, whereas these cells differentiate very well in larger colonies. Um, so just to, to spend a minute talking about theory, this sort of reminded us of a uh, the situation you have in magnetic materials, which you can model very well with the icing model, where right? you have some external magnetic field, which tends to align these spins in one direction. And then, you know, in the icing model, the neighboring spins tend to want to align in the same direction. And so these are sort of the same qualitative effects that you see in this sheet of cells, is that you have some ligand, and the ligand is sort of, sort of an external thing that pushes all cells to the same fate. And then the cells, which are neighbors, want to synchronize with the same fate. And so you can write down a very simple two-parameter model, essentially, where one parameter quantifies the strength of this field, and the other parameter quantifies the strength of the interaction between cells, and asks how well it fits your data. Right, so here we're looking at, instead of just looking at histograms of, say, one cell versus seven cells, we're looking at the fraction of cells in the, uh, say, here in the undifferentiated population as a function of colony size and fitting that to this icing-like model with the curve in black, and you can see it fits. So these two parameter models actually fit quite well. Um, right here's the sort of reverse. If I differentiate the cells, now my pluripart marker goes down with the same trend. And then uh, if I look at the differentiation marker, I see the opposite trend. It goes down in pluripotency and up. Um, and so for, you know, fits with two parameters, I think these fit quite well. You can look at a bunch of other data and compare experiment and theory for, like, these are distributions within the three cell colony. How likely are they to all have the same fate, to have one cell of one fate and two cells of the other fate, and so on. And then without adjusting parameters, basically these all look the same between the model and not. So we think that you can basically sort of almost quantitatively explain everything that we see, at least at equilibrium in these colonies, just with two factors. One is that the ligand pushes you to some particular fate, and the other is that you have some stable, some preference of cells in the colony having the same fate. And if you do the equilibrium statistical mechanics on that, you explain the data quite well. Um, so now we wanted to uh, understand how this works. Uh, the first thing we thought about, which we were hoping it didn't work this way, um, is that you know people told us, OK, well, maybe single cells don't divide very well. They get stuck in G1. And then when they're stuck in G1, they'll differentiate differently. And so we looked at whether they're actually stuck in G1. And we saw no differences in sort of total uh, DNA material based on DAPI staining. We also made a Fuchi line and looked at the fraction of cells in D1 and saw no differences. So there's no cell cycle differences between the smaller and larger colonies. Is there a question? Um, so we, we've basically just subsumed the temperature into the other two parameters. Right, so I mean, you basically have right. It's basically the ratio of your interaction parameter to the temperature. We don't have an independent temperature parameter. Yeah. 
Well, it's an equilibrium model. So the, the output of the icing model is basically the likelihood of any particular configuration. It doesn't have dynamics. And actually, yeah, so, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, go ahead. It's just not a dynamic model, right? It's a, it's a thermodynamic model, which means that it tells you the likelihood of any particular configuration, but it, it just has nothing to say. It, it just tells me if I observe a bunch of different copies of the system at equilibrium, which, you know, equilibrium is basically just a distribution of those different copies, it tells me the likelihood of any of those, right? It doesn't say anything about dynamics, right? So if I were to perturb the system, I, my icing model would not apply until it re-relaxed the equilibrium, right? It, 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 it basically can't model dynamics, especially within a single colony, it can't model dynamics. And actually what we, I think what we, we actually see it where it doesn't, so I'm uh, going way back here. But if you think about these situations, I think what happens, so over here in this region, you have a kind of phase transition and your dynamics get a lot slower. And actually the icing model doesn't fit as well for these couple of data points. And actually what I think we're seeing here is that the transition from pluripotency to differentiated in some of these cases just happens much slower. And so we have non-equilibrium cases, and, and in those cases, you, you, you can't model them with this kind of model. Does that make sense? Yeah, most of the cells are actually proliferating. Well, the, no, I mean, they. Yeah, I think that's. That's because I, because I think your colony distribution reflects your seeding. Right, so you, you see that some. Oh, okay, you don't see them only once. Now. No, we no, we, we could do that, but that then we would right. So so you know you basically have a spectrum of different colony sizes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so it's not colony size. So we were interested in the uh, hypothesis that it's uh, related to signaling. I'm not going to go through the details of all these signaling pathways, but basically there's a number of signaling pathways active in pluripotency, as I talked about a little bit yesterday. So Activin and FGF promote pluripotency, and WINT and BMP uh, promote differentiation. And so uh, we first were interested in starting in, this, uh, in the pluripotent state where we see reinforcement of the pluripotent state. Um, can we either recapitulate or remove this effect by inhibiting any of these pathways? Um, and so the question is, what would we expect to see if we did that? So uh, we use the theoretical model to predict what we would expect to see. Um, and uh, right, one thing is that you would lose this colony size dependence. So if you remove the community effect, right, every colony size should look the same. It's just the cells are originating independently. And the other thing is that you should have, uh, you should see the emergence of these mixed colonies, right, which have some cells of one fate and some cells of the other fate, rather than a reinforcement of the same fate in all the colonies. And so we tested basically small molecule inhibitors to all the pathways I showed you on the previous slide to see if we could find something that met these predictions. Uh, we actually did. Um, so this is a MEK inhibitor, um, and it works pretty well. Um, we were sort of disappointed to find that I, I actually don't think this has anything to do with the MEC pathway. So we tried another MEC inhibitor, it didn't work. We tried an FGF receptor inhibitor, which should be upstream. That didn't work also. We did a bunch of other stuff. And so we actually have a small molecule that can completely remove the community effect, and we still don't know how it works. Um, okay. Um, yeah, so, but we're pretty sure this effect is not specific to MEC. Um, so that's all for what's happening while the cells are still pluripotent. Um, but while the cells are differentiating, right, we see this community effect. And here we have a better chance to have a handle on what's going on because we know what the signaling pathway is that's mediating these events, right? We're dropping in this BMP signal, the cells are signaling, they're adopting some fate. And so we're interested in can we follow the signaling in these cells and can we use that to understand what's happening? And so, uh, we use this uh, reporter. So here we've uh, 
Again, use CRISPR to knock uh, GFP into the SMAD4 locus. SMAD4 is a signal transducer for this pathway and should go to the nucleus when this pathway is activated. Um, so here you see some cells with this reporter. Here's some nuclear markers so we can track these cells. These holes, again, are nuclei. And so you'll see when the ligand is added that these holes fill in. So somewhere there the ligand is added and the holes fill in. And we can track the cells and quantify how they're signaling as a function of time. Um, yeah, it was actually surprising to me how uh, I thought this was going to be super easy. I was like, you know, there's you know, no more than five cells in a colony. We can totally track these for as long as we want. It turned out to be astonishingly difficult to track a colony like this. You know, every 10 minutes for two days, if you insist on losing no cells, and we had, we had to do parts of it manually. But um, anyway, um, so what we found was that if you watch one cell colony signaling, the signaling is quite variable, right? So you'll see cells uh, that signal and then go down. You'll see signals that signal in a more sustained way. Uh, you know, follow cells through division, and sometimes the daughters diverge, um, and sometimes they don't. But if you look at colonies with more cells, the signaling between the cells is basically always the same. So it's correlated between each other, but it's just always the same, right? So you see cells, and with some noise, they basically go on, they respond, and they stay on in a sustained way, right? So you can trace this sort of inhomogeneity in these one cell colonies back to in sort of these heterogeneous responses to signaling where sometimes it's sustained and sometimes it's not. Yeah, so we're just, this is the same way we differentiate them. So right here, you're dropping in this signal. The cell, the signal's floating around, but the cell, the signaling, especially in one cell colony, is very noisy. As you get to higher colonies. Uh, okay, so uh, I'll, if I have time, I'll get to, so both uh, active and nodal and BMP use this signaling molecule. What we found is the active and nodal signaling is adaptive, and the BMP is not. Uh, so so the, uh, if you have both cultures with BMP, the signal is quite constant. TGF beta is, is active and nodal branch. So this is, so uh, the division is at the level of the SMAD signaling molecules. So uh, BMP signal through SMAD 158 together with SMAD 4, and we find those have constant signaling. The uh, active and nodal TGF beta ligands signal through SMAD 23, and those show the adaptive signaling. Okay, so uh, right here's just an example. Right here's before, here's after stimulation. Here's a bunch of single cell traces. And here's some averages, right? So what we find is that the averages diverge between the one and two cell colonies. And this mostly results from the one cell colonies that lose signaling, whereas the two cell colonies have persistent signaling. If you make distributions of you know, the signaling in single cells at different time points during the signaling, right? And we're sort of interested, if I go back, we're interested in Right here, they should be similar. Here, they should be similar. And here, they should diverge. Right, And that's sort of what you see. Right, The pre-stimulus levels are similar. Then you turn it on, and these distributions are similar. Right, But in the one-cell colonies, you have some significant fraction of cells which revert back down to low signaling. And these basically don't exist in the two-cell colonies. The two-cell colonies are almost all at this sort of ratio of 1 or above. And so the hypothesis is that the Right, the cells that fail to differentiate, right, so we know that one cell colonies will sometimes fail to differentiate properly. Now we know from watching the signaling that some of these cells have these low signaling colonies. Um, and we're asking whether the low signaling colonies are the ones that actually fail to differentiate. And so to test this uh, more directly, right, we went ahead and we looked at these low signaling versus high signaling colonies just in the one cell colony case and then stain them for the differentiation marker CDX2 and asked whether there's a difference. And in fact, there's a fairly large difference between these low signaling and these high signaling colonies. right? So the low signaling colonies technically don't express a CDX2, so they fail to differentiate, although some fraction of them do, whereas the high signaling cells differentiate to CDX2 or not. And then if I were to just bin on CDX2 levels in some unbiased way and then ask, you know, what's the signaling in the cells that failed to differentiate versus the signaling in the cells that did differentiate, I also see a difference here, right? So we can, well, we, although we still don't know 
all the details of how it works. What we think is happening is we stimulate the BMP4 pathway in these cells. Somehow interactions between these cells reinforce a uh, uh, sort of high signaling state that stays on in these larger colonies, and that causes more uniform differentiation of these cells. Whereas when you have a single cell, they get initially stimulated, but the response is variable, and that leads to variable outcomes in the differentiation afterwards. Okay, uh, questions about that? Okay, so in the last few minutes I have, I just wanted to tell you a little bit more about our work on signaling dynamics of morphogen pathways, um, and in particular about the signaling dynamics of this nodal pathway, which is uh, important for you know, forming mesoderm, uh, as I've shown in the other assays, among other things. Um, so, uh, right, so just to remind you of the structure of this TGF beta superfamily, the details are not very important, but you have two branches, right? So the BMP branch is what I was just talking to you about. If I have time, I'll show you more data that basically this shows a sustained response. But we've also used these reporters to study the response of the active and nodal branch. Right? So these have different upstream signal transducers, with here the prototype being SMAD2, and here the prototype being SMAD1. They both bind to SMAD4 and make complexes and go to the nucleus and activate target genes. And just to remind you, both of these pathways are extremely important in this gastrulation process that happens in embryos, right? So there's a, basically the trigger for this gastrulation process is a positive feedback loop that involves this BMP signaling through via, no, via wind signaling turning on nodal, which turns back on BMP. And so we ultimately, we really want to understand the dynamics of how these pathways are interpreted and what's happening in these cells as they differentiate. Um, you probably don't need this slide, but just to remind you, right, the way all these assays work is that you have some fluorescent protein. All these things translocate to the nucleus upon uh, stimulation. And so, right, unstimulated looks like this, and stimulated looks like this. Um, and I should also say I'm going to, in sort of the interest of clarity, uh, be a little bit unclear about the cell types of the following experiments. So the, the sort of history is that during my postdoc, I did a bunch of these experiments in a myoblast cell line called C2C12. Um, in my own lab now, um, a postdoc, it's a Hemskirk has been repeating and expanding a lot of these in human embryonic stem cells. And so I'm going to, and we've actually found almost no differences between those two cell lines. So I'm going to show you a mixture of the data between those two cell lines without being terribly clear about which line I'm talking about. But if you're unclear or you want to know more about it, just, just ask me. I just don't want to confuse you. Um, okay, so uh, when we started thinking about this pathway, Everyone sort of saw it. The important thing was the SMAD2, which interacts directly with the receptor, gets phosphorylated, goes to the nucleus, drags the SMAD4 along with it. And so we asked, OK, what are the dynamics of it when I add the ligand? So I add the ligand. The ligand's in red. The signal is in white. And basically, this thing turns on. There's a slight blip, but it stays way above baseline for as long as you'd care to look. So you get some sustained signaling through this pathway. Um, interestingly, if you just go ahead and look at the dynamics of target genes, so this is just done by qPCR in these cells, and you ask, does, do they do the same thing? They don't do the same thing at all, right? So we know the ligand turns on the SMAD2, the SMAD2 turns on and stays on, but when I look at target genes, they turn on rather quickly over the course of a couple hours and then decay just as quickly. So this uh, pathway is adaptive over the time scale, at least in transcription, of four to six hours. And so we were interested in whether this adaptation is mediated by a different component in the signaling pathway. And so we looked at this SMAD4, um, which at the time was sort of thought to be a passive cofactor for the SMAD2 necessary for transcription. Um, but indeed, if you do the same assay, so you tag SMAD4 with GFP and you make these movies, there goes the ligand, SMAD4 responds. But almost as soon as it gets to the nucleus, it turns around and goes back to the cytoplasm. And the dynamics of this look exactly like the dynamics of transcription. Right? So we concluded from these series of experiments that the uh, dynamics of the TGF beta pathway are adaptive, that they're primarily reflected in the cofactor SMAD4 and not in the um, dynamics of this uh, sort of primary response SMAD2. We've actually spent a lot of time over the last couple of years trying to figure out how this adaptive dynamics works, um, so far without terribly much success. Um, one thing we do know is that it's a feedback inhibition that removes this thing from the nucleus. Um, so if you uh, treat cells with cyclohexamide at the 
uh, at the same time that you stimulate them. Cyclohexamide is a protein synthesis inhibitor, so you basically don't allow new proteins to be made. You don't allow feedback to happen, um, and you make a movie, and just to warn you, these cells are going to die horribly after we see the result we want because of the cyclohexamide. So you see this very strong response. It never adapts. Um, the cells will stay on for as long as they're alive, and then they, well, then they die, basically. Not very happy. Um, but this told us, and we've seen the same result in C2, C12 cells, which live for a little longer, right? If you compare the result with cyclohexamide in flu to your normal curve in, uh, just a normal curve. Oh, maybe, okay. Well, the, the pink is quite close to the normal curve. Um, right, you can see that you get a much stronger response and that it essentially never decays until the cells die. No, there, it, it becomes, uh, if you stimulate it to saturation, it becomes totally refractory to later bursts of the ligand. Uh, and if, if I have time, I'll show you a little bit of that. Yeah, and I, I actually think that is important, right, because there are cases where cells, you know, see the ligand and then see the ligand again, and depending on how saturated they are from the first time, it can totally prevent them from seeing the ligand the second time. Yeah. Um, so other features of this response, the amplitude of the response is dose-dependent. The time scale is basically not at all. So if you stimulate with different concentrations of this, right, you increase the amplitude, but you don't change the time scale at all. Um, but um, getting this four-hour window is dependent on having continuous signaling during that four-hour window. So if I inhibit the signaling, so SB is a small molecule inhibitor of the receptor. If I inhibit the signaling sometime during this four-hour window, or if I don't inhibit the signaling, I do this. If I inhibit the signaling after two hours, I drop with this red curve. If I inhibit it after one hour, I drop with this blue curve. So this pathway is kind of constantly sensing what's happening outside the cells. Um, and, um, and, and that's necessary to keep this in the nucleus. But even independently of that, once I get past this sort of four-hour time point, even though the ligand is still there and it's presumably still sensing it, it will adapt. Yeah, that's. So I was wondering, do you have any mutant that is able to bind DNA? I digest this process. Could you just could you determine? Mm. Could you use that as a way to see if there's a target of SARS CoV or SARS CoV? Yeah, that, that's a that's a good experiment. We we. You could still see the signal in the active and the signal out because we're able to bind DNA. I feel it's just fixed. Yeah, I, I I agree. That that's a good idea. That's we we haven't done that, but that that would be that would be cleaner than the cyclohexamide because then you'd prove that it's a SMAD4 target, and also presumably the cells would stay healthy during the. Time. But yeah, that that's a good thought. Okay, we've looked a little bit about whether this happens inside actual embryos. This adaptive signaling um, during my postdoc, we use Xenopus embryos. So again, we use this animal cap tissue, so you can. Uh, inject the mRNA for your reporters, like the SMAD fusions, cut the animal cap off the embryo, put it in a dish, and do imaging. Um, right, and okay, here there's some SMAD1 signaling, but the more important thing is the SMAD4 signaling, and you see these flashes of SMAD4 in individual cells. So we, uh, we, we haven't really proven this, but we interpret this as, as sort of these adaptive signaling that happens in individual cells, whereas upstream SMADs are more constant. Um, <laughs> Okay, so in the last few minutes, uh, so I'd like to tell you about how, so based on these Xenopus results where we see these sort of more interesting dynamics, we got interested in, you know, we know this pathway is adaptive. Can we probe uh, what happens to the cells uh, when we stimulate with more interesting dynamics? If we have finer control over the dynamics to raise and lower them slowly or to do pulses or things like that, um, can, we, uh, can we sort of understand the input-output relationship between the pathway? Um, and so this was a collaboration with Ben Lassor when I was in uh, when I was in Ali's lab. Um, he built this cell culture chip, which is based on a design from Steve Quake's lab. Um, which uh, you know, in my own lab now, we use much simpler microfluidics because this is really overkill for what we need to do, but it's fun anyway. So um, 
Right, so here there's 96 independent culture chambers. You can fill any one of these culture chambers with anything you like. And so right here, I mean, you're filling them all blue or half red and half blue, or here you're filling an individual chamber at a time. And so this allows us to grow cells and then to, in a multiplex way, stimulate them with whatever dynamics of ligand we want. Um, this just gives you some idea of the scale of these microfluidic chambers, right? So here's some cells growing inside this microfluidic chamber, and they'll, if you do things correctly, they'll grow happily for a long time and fill up this chamber. Um, and so the idea behind this was um, to take, instead of always doing our experiments this way, where we just drop the TGF beta in, to stimulate them with different uh, types of uh, input, which will probe different aspects of the signaling response, to measure the signaling response in real time, to think about how these fit to some modeling, and then to think about the consequences for patterning, although I'm not sure I'll get to all this. All right, I'm going to skip this. Actually, I'll, let me do this. Um, so the other thing this enabled us to do was to have a transcriptional reporter. So this is actually a live cell transcriptional reporter based on luciferase imaging. And what you see is if you stimulate these cells, right, they, it, it turns on and turns off in the transcription, just like the signaling does. The half-life here is significantly longer, and that reflects the half-life of the luciferase protein itself, right? So the cells produce this luciferase while the signaling pathway is active, and then the decay that you see here is the decay of the luciferase protein thereafter. And so we can measure both the signaling and the transcription in these cells. Um, so we can do things like pulse the stimulation, and we were interested in sort of mimicking these pulses of stimulation that we saw in the Xenopus embryo, right? And so we saw you can repeatedly pulse the pathway on and off, and get a response to each pulse, which is almost the same length. Um, and then interestingly, if you look at the transcriptional reporter, what you see is because of this longer half-life, which I think is comparable to the half-life of a lot of targets, what you see is that if you have repeated pulsing, um, that the uh, transcription essentially stays on, right? The signaling is going on and off at each step. If I were to just have a long step of signaling, the transcription would go on and off. But if I have pulses of signaling and some reasonable half-life for the uh, luciferase molecule, what I see is the luciferase molecule just build up over time. And so we think this might be what's happening in vivo in the xenopus embryo where everything happens very fast. If you need to keep a uh, target on sustained by this pathway, the way to keep the target on is to just constantly pulse these ligands. And so we see these individual pulses and we're, we hypothesize that these are correlated with sort of sustained expression of differentiation genes. Um, the other thing that we were interested in doing um, is thinking about the response to a spreading morphogen in time. And so if you think about, the, these are sort of cartoons from this paper where they thought about how the uh, active and nodal signaling spreads through the Xenopus embryo in time, right? So it's not terribly important what the profile is, but if you think about any cell sitting here, it's basically seeing increased uh, ligand as a function of time as this morphogen signal spreads through it. And so we asked, OK, we can mimic the cell sitting here and seeing this increased ligand in time by using microfluidics to either rapidly or slowly increase the ligand in time. Um, and to make a long story short, what you see is that if you increase the ligand rather rapidly, right, you see a response which is not really distinguishable from just dropping the ligand in, which is that you get this burst and you get this adaptive response. If you increase the ligand slowly enough, essentially this adaptation process is able to keep up with uh, um, w w w this process of negative feedback, which mediates this adaptation, is able to sort of keep up with your stimulation. So you can keep ramping up and up, and the cells never notice that they're being exposed to this ligand. And so right, what you see here is that you end up, you're going to what's essentially a saturating dose of TGF beta, and the cells have, have not responded at all to what's in there. Um, all right, so I'm running out of time, uh, so I'll just uh, finish with this. So we were interested in uh, sort of probing what is the, um, you know, what are the consequences of this adaptive signaling uh, for cell fate patterning? And we've so far only done this theoretically. Um, and so the idea is that we made a model where you have some morphogen signaling. The morphogen spreads by diffusion and decays. And then the response to the signal depends on this adaptive model, right? So you adapt, and so you really care about the derivative of the signal rather than the signal itself. And I've color-coded some positions along this axis here to, to you know, enable us to think about what's happening at each of these positions. 
And so if you think about the ligand as a function of time at each of these positions, right, so at the black curve you get something like this, at the red curve you get something like this, and so on. And so if I wanted to pattern this tissue, right, I would, um, you know, I could, I could pattern it with sort of a traditional model where I think about how much ligand I have. This all reads the ligand level. And then if I, um, right, if I wait till I get to the end of this time course, right, this is different from this, is different from this, is different from this. And you could imagine cells correlating cell fate with those ligand levels. Um, but on the other hand, if I wanted to make a decision much more quickly, if I think about the derivatives, right, the slopes of these curves are different right from the outset. So a cell that's basing its information on these adaptive pathways is going to be able to make decisions about patterning much earlier. These cells are also, uh, with, you know, by playing, you know, we've been talking about robustness a little bit, by playing with parameters of this model, this is much more robust to certain parameters, right? Uh, one that's easy to understand is the decay rate of the ligand, right? So when you form gradients like this through diffusion and decay, if your ligand, say, in the extreme doesn't decay at all, at some point your gradient fills the entire space. Right, so in that case, there's actually no information in the steady state gradient. Right, the line then has filled the space, and there's no information in the steady state gradient. Um, but even so, how you get to that steady state will be different depending on whether you're here, here, or here. So this sort of derivative model will make a perfectly good pattern in that case, whereas your steady state model will totally fail to pattern. Um, okay, so I think. Yes, that, that is true. You have to, right, you have to assume that you're caring about, right, obviously as you go to steady state, right, your derivative goes to zero. So you, you have to assume that by the time you've reached steady state, your patterning is over. Right? We actually, we don't have evidence that that's what cells yeah, no, do. I just want to yeah. But you, I, but I think actually more realistically, pro right, so, well, let's see if I can go back quickly. If you actually look at these, Right. If you actually look at these responses to different doses, right, they're adaptive, but they also have some constant baseline, right? And so what, what I think is probably more realistic is that you have some targets that care about this adaptive phase and are sensing the derivative, and you have some targets that actually care about these smaller differences that happen in the baseline, and those would be sensitive to these more steady state things. And so probably in real life, right, you have some things taking the derivative and making decisions early, and some things that are waiting longer and making the decisions here. So I don't think they're totally mutually exclusive. Yes. Well, so I, I okay, I, I think the, these are actually cartoons. I think they're for nodal, but it, it doesn't really matter. Um, but yeah, so and I, and what these come so this paper they actually what they actually did was just stain for activated SMAD, beta catenin, and phospho -ERK as a function of time, and just make maps of what the signaling is, right? So if I, okay, so if, which is maybe not a great assumption, but if I, if I assume that there's a cell sitting here, right, this, this is what its signaling level is in phospho SMAD2 as a function of time, right? And what are Experiments show is that what's happening in SMAD4, and therefore the transcription of at least some targets, is some function of how this phosphosmad 2 is changing. Right? So if this phosphosmad 2 changes quickly, I see this adaptive response or not. Right? So I, in, in some sense, I think we can use this data on these upstream readouts to say, you, you know, I, I don't know, uh, I'm not saying anything about where the sources of ligand are, or, right, and in BMP, actually, the, a lot of the important dynamics come from the inhibitors secreted from the Spamon organizer with sort of carve out a territory. Um, but all we're saying is, okay, I look at the, 
all of our data suggests that the looking at the proximal responses is a good proxy for looking at the engagement of the receptors. So I'm looking at how the receptors are engaged in time and then thinking about how intracellularly that would be interpreted. Okay, so I, I think I'm basically out of time, so I'm going to skip some of this and just acknowledge uh, some of the, so uh, they're not on there, but I should acknowledge Eric uh, Sigia and Ali Brevenloo. I started this work in their labs. Um, the, all the stuff I told you about the micro colonies uh, was the work of Anastasia Nemeshkalo. Uh, the stuff on ectodermal patterning was the work of George Britton. Uh, the stuff on shapes was uh, Sapna's work and the stuff on beads and also on some of the active and dynamics with its this work and funding agencies and I'm happy to take any more questions.